We are joined today in person in Charlotte by two of my good friends, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Kyle Busch, um, two of the all-time legend stock car racers. Got to know them living here in Charlotte. For you guys to take time to not only be here together, apparently we have to dive into some maybe some past rivalries. We can touch on that here in a second. But for you guys to agree to come on together and talk about your upbringings, both now as parents in the past, coming up through the world of youth sports, I appreciate you guys joining me here on You Think. Absolutely. Right on. Thanks for having me. So so give me a, so before, we were, we were talking about a little collaboration, and I asked you like how the, the NASCAR world would react. And, Dale, you said that they wouldn't know. Is there something the fans should know? Is there Our fan bases are not well aligned <laughs> me and That's kyle me and kyle it. have a, had a bit of a history on the racetrack but have since uh you know become pretty good buds but our fan bases still are having a hard time understanding how to be in the what, same is room there like, together is there like one particular story that if i ask like your, oh yeah your diehard fans that are outside your shops wearing your hats and your gear like what's the story Tell, tell this novice NASCAR who just learned it from moving to Carolina. Do you want to tell it? Come on, I'll, give me the story. I'll, we can tell it. I, I, uh, 2008 Richmond. Yeah. Um, he, we are racing for the league, couple, three laps to go, and he got loose underneath me in three, and uh, I spun. And uh, I had just moved to a team that he had just left. There was a, there was a kind of a weird Got awkwardness it. amongst Got it. all that. We were – Animosity. Yeah, and I'd wrecked him at The year Kansas. before, yeah. Yep. So I mean, there was some things not good, and I wasn't handling it good. He wasn't handling it great, and and so and we went back and forth in the media a bunch. And <laughs> little did I know that I was. I'm just gonna pretend that you guys have been bitter enemies to today. Like today was the moment that you guys made your friendship work. So as far as our viewers here on you think are concerned, you think is what brought you two together. So oh, okay. congratulations right. to me. Great. Pleasure. To nice yes. to see you. I'm really you. glad we worked Absolutely. through this. Thank right? you. Kyle, would you like to add any more to the story before we move on? No, he hit it right. The uh, the culmination of events took place 2008 Richmond. So uh, We actually did uh, patch up our differences on a podcast. Which right. one? Mine. Dale Jr.'s, yeah. I invited him on. We went over it. I just had the pleasure. It. We had a great conversation where – um, Kyle was super honest about how he saw whole, his whole set of events and his perspective of the whole thing, and um, so it was I, it was great for me, and I think it was good for Kyle. And we've since, even before that, though, I mean, we were kind of we, were yeah, fine. I mean, I, I saw, we, we talked for a long time at Dale's Hall of Fame induction party. Right. Yeah. I was like, I we never were, sensed any real animosity. No, so no, no. That glad we cleared ago. the air. Yeah. Glad we cleared the air. Exactly. Would your fans say the air is cleared? The fans mine, take it probably mine harder. Probably than, would. Yeah. I, I don't know that. I don't know some, that his some of mine are now Kyle fans. Some, some of them that's good. We call them unicorns. Yes. Um, some of them, <laughs> <laughs> some of them still hold the grudge, you know. And your fans are passionate, and right. and and they don't forget anything. And some of them don't get over it. Right? So now we want to figure out how to collab, right? So right, yeah. So I have a vodka drink, and he has rowdy energy. His energy drink's doing really well. Our vodka drink's trying to get off the ground, and we're we're thinking about some ready to drinks. Put them in a can. And That's right. So are we gonna make this happen? We, just, we can we, make it happen. We can get rowdy on a high rock for sure. We, I mean, we get, <laughs> I love that. That was that's that. I mean, I, we're making magic here, boys. <laughs> yeah. We're uh, we're tagline. We're making now. magic. And before we jump in, Kyle, congratulations. As of this recording, you just won your sixtieth. Is that's that right? Correct. Yeah. Thank saw you. Saw Of course, we we all saw you this past weekend. So at the time of this recording, hopefully it's sixty-one or two by the time it comes out. That'd be nice. That'd be great. But at the time, congrats. But uh, Yeah, we had this scheduled, and so I had to make sure yeah. to go out and win. So if you want, you can schedule me like every week. You, you are a I'll recurring – I'll just come in for like five minutes. And you're a recurring guest. We're going to meet up here at the track, at the, at the shops, and uh, we'll talk whatever you and your son did at the racetracks the previous couple weekends. You and uh, you keep winning, and we're all happy. There's a I'll lot jump on that. Dale's pod, and, which I just had the luxury of joining for the first time, so that was a blast. Right and, uh, all right, so let's jump in. So – as you guys know, here on You Think, like we are fascinated and also like beyond stressed and frustrated as parents about like navigating the world of youth sports. So I, I want you guys to take us back to your. So Dale, I'm going to start with you. Everyone, of course, understands your upbringing, kind of the first family, so to speak, of racing with your father and your grandfather and, and everyone in your family kind of grew up in this area in, in the in the racing world. Like. Take us back to your childhood, like your earliest memories of being around the tracks, your earliest memories of being around, you know, what eventually became your career. You know, what 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 are the first memories you have of just being around the sport? Um, probably uh, at Charlotte Motor Speedway, I was at a qualifying session 
for the for one of the Charlotte races, one of the cup races, and we were watching the cars qualifying. That was probably 1982 or 83. Um, I was about seven years old. Uh, my parents separated, and I lived with my mom till 1981. And our house burnt down. We was in this small house in Kannapolis and woke up one morning, and the kitchen's on fire. And uh, and so uh, she was broke and had to give custody of me and my sister to m- my dad. And so now I'm over my dad. We never saw dad. He was, I remember maybe staying at his house one weekend. So I didn't really know him. It was really weird. But, uh, and you're how old at this point? Six. Okay. And so we, next thing I know, I'm in dad's garage on the lake, uh, going through my toy box, making sure all my toys made it right. Uh, all the other stuff is all our stuff. Mine and Kelly stuff's in the garage. But, um, and we started going to the racetrack. Now I'm at a racetrack. Now I'm, I'm like, this is cool. This is fun. Racing's amazing. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, instantly, instantly you're you're drug into that world and loving it, loving everything about it. And Kyle, for you, of course, everyone's aware of you and your brother and, and your brother Kurt. Growing up in Las Vegas, your father Tom was kind of a short track legend, if I had that right, in his own right. Kind of grew up around the garage, grew up around the game. So, like, wh- what do you remember? Like, when did you first feel like driving and racing? And and, and you started way younger than Dale, right? Dale, you started as a teenager, twelve when I ran. Okay, so like not my quite. First competitive. And how old were you? Thirteen. So okay, pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah, I mean, so my yeah, you're right. My dad was really good amateur racer, you know, in Las Vegas, and that's where he kind of made his racing career. Never went back east in order to make it professional or anything. So um, as he was racing through the ranks and stuff, I remember the earliest days I can remember, probably five, six years old, something being at the racetrack. But my, the story, the legend is I was there at two weeks old, you know, yeah. um, at the racetrack for my dad's racing and stuff. But uh, just been around it the whole time, all the time. And, you know, my dad always had cars in the garage, whether it was a 1932 Ford coupe that we were always kind of working on and, and getting ready and building up. And then, you know, his um, hobby stocks and then his late models and things like that. Um, but once... Kurt was old enough to start racing. He sold his big car stuff and bought two little cars. They're Legends cars, Dwarf cars, kind of that same things. Um, And so those two could race. Now, I'm six and a half years younger than Kurt, so as Tom and Kurt were racing, then uh, I was just kind of working on the cars and all that sort of stuff, always in the garage, always being a part of it. Actually, I would video a lot of the races as well, too, so we could go back home and rewatch and stuff like that. But then once I was old enough, um, 13, I finally got my shot behind the wheel. And as, as you asked, like growing up being there, like I always envisioned myself driving, wanting to drive. Like I really had that, that itch to drive. Um, but you never know if you're really going to be it in order to be able to make it. So we just did it as a hobby really. And then it kind of formulated and turned into something more. And then how much, I'm always curious to this, like how much is the experience at the young, you know, you're talking 12, 13 years old and younger, like how much is like living in Las Vegas, how different or similar maybe is that race experience for a young kid in those days to living in Kannapolis or in the, you know, in the Charlotte area? Like, is it similar opportunities or what you're doing in Vegas and what you're doing growing up in, in Carolina? Like, is it, is it the same? Is it different? I think it's a lot different. I mean, your dad obviously came from the local tracks, right? And then made his way up and became one of the the top guys of our sport where my dad never really went farther beyond just racing at the local level um could you go from could your father have like did guys from his local you call them local tracks like did any of them make it on or was it more common down here in the south more common here in the south okay. i mean yeah there's guys from the west coast that have made it i mean hornaday made it harvick's made it jimmy, you know yeah, jimmy, jimmy. Uh, larson myself okay. my brother you know but i think the biggest thing i asked my dad that one time i was like how come you never like thought about it and right. moved back east in order to go do it and he was like i didn't have any money right like there was absolutely and i was like well you, you hear the stories of like richard and dale and all those guys and like they didn't have any money they just what they did they lived they did you know like why didn't we yeah. do that and he was like no i think we were on an even more different level than what they were so yeah so what so you talk about money so, so you're growing up right and money and access in today's sports world is even crazier i mean whether it's racing or whether it's travel soccer money is at the root of the experience so so take us back dale you're growing up you, you mentioned you, you move with your dad you're around the track you're around the garage but like who's financing all of this like when you guys are growing up if you can't do it yourself does it not get done like is the car only as good as your skills as a mechanic or is there other people 
doing the work? Like, how does this whole thing work at an early age? Well, it happens in a lot of different ways, I think. But um, I got a go-kart. Uh, Dad had a friend. His son was racing. And so they sold Dad a go-kart so that we could all we could go with them and race. And Dad went to maybe the first race. And I ran only a total of about 10 races when I was 12. And when he was at the first race, it was amazing. He was helping. We pushed a cart to the starting line. Uh, he was part of, he was helping me. You know, we were doing this And at together. the time, is he Dale Earnhardt? Yeah, he's, he's Dale like, Earnhardt. He's Dale Earnhardt now. Yeah, so, like, is, what is that like? This is probably 86. Yeah, so he's you know, the man. Yeah. I mean, he's. It was pretty, it was great uh, that we were doing something together. Otherwise, I, I was just, I was just, you know, following him wherever he went and doing, you know, trying to be where he was, but we didn't do anything together. Right. Uh, we didn't go out in the yard and play or anything like that. So this was great. And then I ran a few more races, and he wasn't there. We He was working and racing, and so I'd have to go with someone else, and that wasn't a fun experience. Um, but later on, uh, around 15 years old, me and my brother were sitting at a table kind of like this, and Dad laid a newspaper down, and it had a, a article on the front page of the sports about a new street stock series starting at Conquer Merge Speedway. And he said, you and your brother – should look at this, read this article. And so me and Kerry read the article, and we got it right away. We're like, he wants us to do this. <laughs> you know. So I took the same go-kart that I bought. dad bought me yep. uh, at 12. I took that go-kart and sold it for 500 bucks. And me and my brother walked around town asking you know, a uh, gas station. A guy, guy we knew owned a gas station, man, give us a couple hundred bucks. And a Hardee's down the street. At, we had his... Uh, you know, we had a relative that worked there and managed it, and they gave us five hundred dollars. So they're like your early sponsors. Yeah, in so essence. we awesome. we put it together and and went down the road. And Dad didn't micromanage none of it. I mean, we he just made sure the world cage was in there so we wouldn't get hurt. Yeah. But otherwise, I mean, we broke we rebuilt the engine. It was a two eighty three two barrel. wasn't going to be fast. wasn't going to do well. Very small engine. We blew it up the first race. <laughs> um, we didn't know you know nothing. We didn't know what we were doing, and and Dad just let us go flounder right and it was probably the best experience because um had somebody been over our shoulder or doing everything for us and made this car really great uh and and we wouldn't have known why we were doing what we were doing why we were um we wouldn't have known how to fix things and we burnt a wheel bearing out every other week we couldn't figure out why you know we're running this stock wheel bearing on the right front we couldn't figure out well why won't it why is it burning out we keep packing it we keep putting new grease in it it just wasn't tough enough to handle the load so we had to change the right front spindle and get a bigger get a whole bigger setup up there and we learned that ourselves and crawling under cars in the junkyard that was the worst part um worried about snakes and everything (laughs) that's awesome and and you both have touched on it and and dale obviously we're familiar with your father and his legacy and just hearing you talk about how much connecting with him at the racetrack like reinforced your relationship with him so Kyle I'd ask you the same thing like how much did the experience of racing with your father with your brother like how much impact did that have like yes you loved it but like how much of it did you love because it was a way to connect with your dad like I, I like my dad was my high school football coach so much growing up all I wanted to do was not play college football, not play professional football. Like, I wanted to play for my dad's high school football team. Like, to me, how cool is that on a Friday night, you and your brother and your dad, same team? Like, how much did racing allow, I guess, both of you, but I'll ask you, Kyle, first, like, how much did that connection with your father and your family, like, how much did that lead to the love of racing? A a lot. I mean, he was basically the main reason why I got into racing. If you ask my mom, she wanted me to be an orthodontist, you know, so... (laughs) Um, but being with my dad, being in the garage, you know, during his, you know, six to 12 years old for me, I was in the garage working when we went to the racetrack, I wasn't old enough to be in the pits. You had to be 16 to have a pit pass. So I'm sitting in the grandstands just with grandma and whatever, and not really being a part of the show. Like you're saying like that time with your dad and your brother in the track at the track. Um, but it was always during the week in the garage, you know, so my dad was a Mac tool man. He drove a route all day long selling tools. He'd come home, we'd work on cars until it was time to go to bed and restart the process over the next day. Right. But once I became 13, now him and I are going to the racetrack together, traveling. So now we get that time of being in the pits together, working together, you know, and, and I, one of the fondest memories that I have was uh, we ran our car all for the first season and we had some bumps and bruises along the way, you know, and I 
oil filter came off. I hit the fence and, you know, whatever. So we repaired the car all year long, ran the whole year on one car. We won a ton of races, won a championship with it. But uh, at the end of the year, you know, I was trying to talk my dad into it. Like, hey, you know, we should tear this car apart. We should freshen it up. We should repaint it, like make it look pretty for the next year. And he was like, oh, hell no. Like, we're not spending that money. Like, we're not doing that. Like, why do you need to look good to go out there and, and win races, you know? So I had the bright idea, well, okay, if I tear this thing down all the way to the bare chassis, he'll have no other reasons than to say, okay, let's repaint it, right? So I tear the whole thing down. It's complete nothing. And my dad gets home, and he goes, cool, good job. Did you learn anything about tearing it apart? Uh, now you can put it back together. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> he, he was like, he was like, look, I'll buy you a couple cans of spray bomb and I'll buy you some new bolts and some new nuts and things like that. And you can freshen it up that way, you know, but like, we're not taking it and repainting this thing. So, um, you know, having that time of just being able to understand and having my dad teach me. So, so we're different because his dad was always gone, right. Or was busy during the weeks and things like that. So my dad, you know, had a normal job and was home and we would go travel on the weekends together, race together. So we had a, we have a different upbringing, a little different perspective on, on how we were taught about the cars and such. But my dad and some of his other good friends that are very good in racing, you know, we all work together and I learned all from them and I would challenge them too, like, Hey, well, like you just said, like we learned about the wheel bearing, right? Like I learned about springs and I learned about cambers and I learned about air pressures and stuff by asking questions and being like, what if we did this? What if we tried that? And he was always like, well, if you do that, then have you thought about this other three things that might happen because of that? So it's a whole convoluted process, you know, of, uh, of working on a car versus being a, a stick and ball sport yeah. type guy. And, and I think the part that I hear that I think is so, <clears throat> so important for our audience and, and such a big theme of what we do here at You Think is that whole approach as, and again, we're going to talk about your perspective now as fathers here in a minute, but hearing you both talk, and especially you, Dale, like here's Dale Earnhardt, who at the time, he's the king of the sport and he's helped pushing your car into, you know, your early races. But then at the same time, he's saying to you and your brother, go race. Like, I'm not Dale, I'm not looking over your shoulder. You're not racing as Dale Earnhardt's kid. Like, you guys are you're not going to have the best car. You're not going to have the most – I'm not going to buy you. Like, so much of the challenge right now that, that I feel both as a father and so many other people throughout the country that we talk to, like, what is that balance between giving your kids opportunity but also letting them fall flat, letting them race a slow car? Dale, he could have – your dad could have gotten you a better car. He could have gotten some of the guys on his crew to fix it up. But there was such a value in his mind – to make you learn it and, and here you talk about it the same way like all right yeah you broke the car apart put it back together like how where where did you guys feel along that spectrum of like parental push versus parental support like where did you guys fall and now looking back on it would you do it differently is we're going to get to obviously your experience now Kyle with Brexton but like when you think back on those years are you thankful your dad said go race the slow car I think that um he he feels similar to me like if 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 my daughter is interested in something and is like tugging on your pant leg going, I want to do that. I want to try it. You're going to give them that opportunity or help them get that opportunity. Yep. And until, but until they're like showing you that interest, like you're not going to shove them in that direction and go, Hey, you should you might like this. Um, you know, go, go, go. Uh, so he, I think, you know, he, he knew racing, and the way racing kind of works, at least the way it did back then, is like, you know, we're, you, he took the slower car, and he learned how to make that car better. And he wanted to make that car faster, and that's all he had at his disposal was what was in front of him, like in the 70s when he was trying to get going. So he lived all that and showing initiative and working, his, you know, working as hard as you need to to get to that next level. He lived it, and he knew that, um, he knew what he needed to see out of me or Carrie and even Kelly. He knew what he needed to see, uh, whether we were going to have the initiative and the motivation to do it. And, and there were times when I didn't show it or I didn't have it, you know, and, and he didn't give me, he didn't help. He, he didn't show any interest uh, in me becoming a race car driver. You know, there were days when I'd walk up and go, I want to race. I want to become a race car driver. And he's like, well, what are you doing to make that happen? <laughs> And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you should be in the garage cleaning tools. I was sweeping floors when I was your age. I'm like, well, how does that get me to driving? Like, that <laughs> make no sense, right? And I just right. couldn't. And it took me a while to figure that out. And 
but he would not lift a finger unless you were willing to do the same, you know, and show some initiative. He wasn't going to lay it out there in front of you. And, um, you know, he was pretty – Kyle understand this, talking a little nuts and bolts, but, you know, in the when we were racing late model stocks, me and my brother and my sister in the 90s, the coilover three-link car was the really most successful car at the time. And uh, But we had trailing arm big spring cars. And I would try to sneak in the shop and, and put coilovers on our cars and even, you know, cut them up and carry on to try to get them, get a coilover set up on there. And he wouldn't let us do it. And he's like, if you ever get to the Cup Series, that's what they're racing. You're not going to, you're not going to run a coilover car just because it's better or faster or handles better. Or it's a hot ticket right now. If you ever get to the Cup car or Xfinity level, this trailing arm big spring car is what we race. So this is what you'll drive and learn how to use and work and, and, I always I was like, man, well, I'm getting beat. I probably wasn't. I probably could have taken that trailing arm big spring car and made it beat the coilover car. But in my mind, I'm thinking, man, I'm, I got my arms tied behind my back here trying to race this car. But so he had uh, – he wasn't just like go down the road and figure it out. He had like a purpose. Yeah, there was he, a method to that. There was a method. Yeah, that's you know, interesting. Which is – yeah, which made you feel like, oh, it matters a little bit to him. Right. This is it would you know, he does care that we're yeah. we're trying to follow in those footsteps. Yeah, and I think the lessons are so you said like stick and ball sport versus driving and racing, like there's so many constant themes. It's a different sport, it's a different approach, it's a different journey, but like the lessons are all very similar and like and raising your kids and to parenting with with and you know, without a sport. So Kyle, like along those same lines, I follow your son on Twitter. I see Brexton. He's got that cute little racing jumpsuit. He's, Serve Pro is his sponsor. I mean, he's racing real now, right? He's not just as a hobby on, you know, every few nights, mom and dad take him over to the track because it's cute and he rides around. I mean, he, at least from the outside perspective and from talking to you about it, like, he's racing. So as you, as you and Dale sit here and you share your stories with your parents and your fathers and your, you know, brother and you and your brother and sister, like, and you think back, all right, well, now bring us into, like, the modern era now of growing up in this world. So you're, you're living it firsthand with Brexton. We were talking about your nephew, uh, Dale Wyatt, Kelly's son, who's 10, a little older, doing the same thing. They're both going to the same track tonight. Like, talk us through what's going on now. Like, give us an insight into this world because I'm fascinated by it. Yeah, so similar to, to Dale when he was talking about his girls, like, if they're interested in something, they want to do something, like, you know, let's, let's go help them do that, but let's not force it down them. So... Brexton was interested. He, one of his buddies had a go-kart, so he wanted to go to the go-kart track. We watched. He liked it. And we were like, okay, we'll put him in that car. And he borrowed a kid's car to make a few laps to start with. And then he enjoyed it. We got our own stuff. And we've kind of taken – we bought used stuff, somebody else's car, like not the fastest car, not brand new. but And that was our start, and that's where we got started. So last year, you know, he – his first year, I guess, we're all well, – this is start of year three, I guess um, – but his first year, he was in cadets. He won a few races. He moved up to beginner. Last year, he won a few more races. And then now this year, um, he's in beginner again. But he's one of the top dogs in, in beginner. Wyatt, who's your nephew, was in beginner box stock class last year. And he won the championship on the Tuesday night series. Brexton won the championship on the Saturday night series at the same track. That's so wild. Yeah. So uh, Are you guys, like, there watching this? Like, All right, so just real quick, and I'll let you finish your story. Like, you're there. You're Kyle Bush, Dale Earnhardt Jr. I mean, you guys are like the premier names of this sport. And you're there watching your nephew. You're there with your son. Like, are you guys like up against a wall? Are you in the grand scans? Like, what is the experience like for you guys taking this all in at like the local speedway down the street? Yeah, no, I'm in, I'm in it. I mean, I'm I'm there. I'm I'm entrenched. It. I, mean, <laughs> I I'm, love it. I'm working on that. I don't build the cars. I do have to have somebody that's there every day to okay. build the cars because they're at KBM and my house uh -huh. is 40 minutes away. But, um, anyways, like I'm entrenched. Like I'm at the racetrack. I've learned these things now. Like I've learned how the dirt changes. I've learned how the night progresses, where you can make changes to the car air pressure adjustments or whatever adjustments that you make to make sure the car is keeping up with the conditions of the track. Right. And so I've kind of learned that a little bit and I've had some help. You know, you talk to the other dads. It's really cool. It's really chill. Like everybody's kind of laid is back. Is it mostly dads running the crews for these young, oh, young yeah. kids? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, uh, yes. So there's other dads out there that that's all they do. They work on their kids' carts every day they come home from school. No different than what I did when right. I was a kid racing. And their, and their dad just has a job as a whatever. Right. Not a race. He's not yeah. a driver. He's just could be a fireman. Whatever he's doing. Yeah, yeah. got it. But 
I don't have that luxury necessarily because I'm so busy running around doing so yeah. many other things. Like we would make it to one race a month if I was the one working on that car. Yeah, right. I mean, I just wouldn't have the time to do it, but, um, I'm in it, you know, when, when the car goes on the racetrack, I'm up on the fence, like I'm watching it. And then when we get to the heat races and the, and the main event time, like I'm standing back, like I'm recording it, videoing it. We also have an onboard camera with the car so we can put that together and we can watch and help him. And that's been one of the biggest things that's helped his growth pattern over the last 16 months has just been watching video. Like he'll actually ask, he'll come off the track and be like, Hey man, show me that video. Like I remember such and such on lap three, I passed so and so. Like I want, I want to. Like he passed me back. Why did he pass me back? And that's we, interesting. And we go look at it, and we go. And watch mind it. you, to everyone listening, if you don't follow him on Twitter, like me, he's a month, a week away from being seven. Correct. A month away, whatever yes. it is. He's yeah. Almost seven. Almost seven. He's yeah. He's, he's six. not nineteen. Right. <laughs> okay. So, so the <laughs> difference. One more thing is is like the difference between me when I started racing or being in the shop working on the cars, all that sort of stuff. Is I had that time and our cars were at our house, right? Well, now his cars are at my race shop, which is 40 minutes away from the house. Like I want him to get to the point where he can go spend a day or two at the shop a week and he gets to learn them and he gets to work on them and he can actually figure out what tools are right. and use that stuff. I mean, we're playing with RC cars right now. So he's learning a little yeah. bit about that stuff with, with RC cars, but like getting him to understand, um, you know, the vehicles and how to build them and what it takes and all that sort of stuff is definitely still on my radar that I want to make sure that he learns and understands. So he's not just a, a kid that comes in with money and he can go make it up the ladder and never work on a car. My question in all seriousness, Dale, is like, what about your personality is just how you've always been? Was there a learning curve to that? Like, how did you handle all the success, the heartbreak, everything in between, and like always maintain the demeanor that it seems you're having sitting right next to me? I, don't, I think that um, I was going to go home. So if we had a bad day, I was going to go home and I was going to sulk and, and, and I was going to drag that through the week. And so <clears throat> the sooner I could start to unravel that uh the better and um so I would try to even if it wasn't tr exactly true in the moment I would try to start to unravel that depression or that frustration as soon as I could because I didn't want to have a, a, a awful week I didn't want to go home and be miserable I was gonna um you know when uh, when you don't do what you think you should have done in a race or don't finish where you think you should have done you, you feel that until the next chance you get to get in the car and, and start over, right? Every, every weekend was a chance to, to redeem yourself or prove that last weekend was not who you are. And so um, I had those emotions inside that, man, I'm mad, I'm depressed, or I'm frustrated, or I just want to throw something or, or pitch a fit. Um, but I had to – I didn't want to – I had things going on in the week. Yep. You know, we got autograph sessions or meet and greets, or I had a got trip. family, I got, got a, a wife family and kids, or a trip, yeah. a trip planned, or I was going to yeah. do something my buddies Tuesday, and so I, I knew that I didn't want to be miserable in those experiences. When you go live your life during the week, I would didn't want to be like, oh, yeah, boy, damn, yeah, you know, I get it. And so I would try immediately to like to repair whatever the hell was going on in my 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 emotions, um, as fast as I could. And try to figure out, like, to make some sort of common sense, rational sense of what, you know, okay, well, we'll figure it out. And then I'm going to go, we're gonna, we'll find out why that didn't work or why the car did what it did or, or I'll fix what I did wrong. Um, and uh, and the one thing you learn about relation now, it's not, it, Kyle doesn't have this experience because he wins a lot. But most people. Not as often as I used to. <laughs> <laughs> most people in racing. You're going to lose a lot of races. So a lot gonna, more than you're ever going to win. Ever. And that's, that was, uh, you never get good at that. Yep. You never, you never get okay with, man, I might lose all of them this year, right? Yeah. Um, What's you, a good year? How many, how many races would be like a spectacular, the guy who wins it all? I mean, like, six, I think five, six wins in a season is like, man, that's what. And, five, and, five is a good year. Yeah. Five out of, but you race 40 weekends, 35, Thir 36, 30, 36 weekends. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I, I always think about this with golfers. I call them my golf buddies. It's very similar to you guys. You have a, a huge field and there's going to be one winner. Every time we took the field, 
it was like a 50-50 shot. There was only two teams, right? right. So you, every weekend, every you had a chance. But yeah. there's 53 guys that get the chance to win, right? Half on the that guys, team. half the guys are always going to be part, whether they were worth a shit or not. Right. Half the guys get to go in the locker room as winners, and the other half, the guys who played great, the guys who played like crap, were losers. You guys, it's, you either, you know, we always joke because we all saw Talladega Nights, right? If you're not first, you're last. You know, everyone makes a joke of it, but like in your world. Second place and back, losers. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you guys deal? Like, what is your approach to dealing with the inevitable failure that is kind of embedded in your sport? Yeah, you just know it's possible. I, it's gonna be. It's gonna happen more than it's more than more than winning. I mean, yeah. F- for me, like the fire, the desire, the drive, the everything for me is is all about winning, right? Like, it's yeah. it's, it's the winning. It's the the feeling you get of just being able to know that you topped all the rest of the guys that day, but also you're rewarding your team for yeah. the, all the people that are around you that are helping you doing what you're able to do. Like the driver gets the glory, but really it's the it's the whole team organization, everybody that that also enjoys yeah. in, and in that win. So um, I'm, I'm the worst. Look, I'm the worst loser ever. So <laughs> yeah. and and I and I do my fair share it. of it. I'm uh, not a great loser either. I'll be honest. I've had some bad moments. I'm not a good loser either. Yeah. So it's just, I don't know. Like I've never really figured it out. Even to today, like we've we've gone through a tough stretch this year. Like you know, Vegas earlier this year, we were leading the race. We were coming down to the final laps of the race, leading, and there was a late race caution, and then we had to do a pit stop, and then you know, I, I didn't win, and I was so infuriated because like that was one that got away. Yeah. You know, and then this weekend at. Bristol dirt, you know, I'm running third. Like I was up front all day, ran close, ran good. Like we were going to be like, okay, let's go home. We got third, whatever, fine. Um, and then the seas kind of parted ways. I was able to win the race. The front two guys got together. They crashed each other out and I took the win. And after the race is over, like I just get out of the car and I go up to the, to get the checker flag and I get back in the car. And it's just like, ho hum. Like I'm not all pumped up, yeah. like excited, like overly excited because we stole one. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. People are like, well, why weren't you excited you won? You won the race. And I'm like, eh. I get it. We stole one, you know? So it wasn't like you go out and dominate and beat everybody into the ground. You're going to be like, damn right we did. You know, those are the ones you're pumped up and excited about. Not all wins are the same and not all losses are the same. Exactly. And I don't understand how people can tell you how to take your wins and how to take your losses. Like, there is always a comment on every single thing, and it drives me bonkers. Like, when I won my second championship – Everybody was like, oh, my gosh, like, what's wrong with Kyle? Like, he wasn't excited. He wasn't jubilated. Like, he, like it was just monotone. And I remembered my first championship. We were all so excited. And, like, you're turning around. You're looking for everybody. You want to see this person, this person, this person, this person. I forgot, like, the whole thing. Like, it, like, it's the day that didn't exist. So, like, this time I tried to slow it all down and, like, put it in slow motion so you can, like, see everything yeah. and take it in and all that. And it was just a different experience for me. And I saw it through a different way of enjoying a championship. Yeah. And I get bashed on it because you're it's, gonna get bashed on everything nowadays. Yeah, you guys know that. No, you no guys kidding. your connection to the fans is very unique in the sports world. Right? The the amount of interaction. I mean, I remember being at races and like people are standing in the garage and people that'd be like people coming in our locker room and standing on the sideline during the game. Yeah, you got people in right. the pits, you got people the access that fans have now it's part of the beauty of the sport because they truly feel like those guys waiting outside your outside your shop today asking for like those guys like feel a part of your team it's a very being around and learning the nascar world and learning the race world like it's a very interesting connection between the drivers and the fans i mean that's a real bond i mean the nascar sales piece has always been the most passionate fan base in no sports question. you know like no question you have fans that are fans of the Washington Redskins or the Carolina Panthers or whatever, they probably don't even know but two guys that are on the team. It was a by random name. today's a random Tuesday and outside of De- when we walked out of right. Dale's shop, there was fifty people outside. Yeah. And every one of them had his hat on, his in his hoodie or his t shirt and had little replica cars. They had pictures. I mean it was like I was like, Dale, you do these guys here every day? He goes, just every Tuesday. I said, because <laughs> they know you're recording. He goes, Yeah. And they went out and he, obviously it was I, I just think it's what you guys handle and deal with on a day-to-day basis. I think it's impressive. So is it really that big of a difference between the dirt and the – you guys yeah. keep differentiating between, oh, this is a dirt 
this is asphalt. Like, it's is it two different worlds? Totally, totally different worlds. Interesting. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah Kyle's talked about it. How he's having to learn. You know, he's actually while, while Brayson's learning to drive, he's learning how to fix the car because some of the changes that we make on our pavement cars do not. It doesn't work that way in the dirt mm -hmm. world. And so. Mm -hmm. Kyle's and the other night, the race was on dirt, right? So how different is that for those guys? Like, is it? It's a whole. No matter, even if you're a professional at your guy's level, it's, if we stuck it's a guy similar but different. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the way you drive the car, the way you attack the track, and all that is entirely That's different so than cool. you ever would pavement. Now you can take some of your pavement lessons and get in and get into it. Like we had a long run there in the middle of the race and the groove was yeah. kind of starting to widen out right but if you're a dirt racer you want to get it all sideways and on the right rear and driving off the corner crooked but if you're a pavement guy like me and you're just kind of riding and chilling like you're just cruising into the corner yeah, turning left the whole time and then when it gets a little loose you just control the loose like and lap times aren't that much different between the dirt guy driving crazy and the pavement guy driving straight really? and straight and steady so it just it, it kind of depends and and i'm not so the dirt guys are comfortable about putting it out there and being crooked and sideways and all that and knowing car control better that way where sometimes they get on pavement and they want to do that but they're not as fast because they can't feel the car more per se right versus myself i'm more a pavement guy although i've i've run dirt before yeah right. but i grew up more pavement That's style and so i'm i'm more of of that kind yeah. Well, the, this last segment is it's called like the being a football guy versus a baseball no, guy. I know, but I'm just trying to like find <laughs> what the parallel would be. I mean, like we don't the game doesn't change much for us. Like the biggest it would change be tennis. Would be it would be like being on a tennis court. Versus hard court. Yeah. Yes. I'm trying to like relate it to. I mean, we have astro, we have turf and we have grass. You're gonna wear different cleats, we right? We wear different cleats. The way you would never change how you ran your route. You would never change. I don't. So you don't have different grip between you have di the cleats feel different, right? We'd have seven stud mold. You go up to Chicago in the fall and it's wet and it's damp and it's dewy and the grass is it feels like the grass is up to your knees. You're running like a cow pasture versus you go down to South Florida right. and you go down to the down. So you to have to have different technique. So you have different cleats, different texture. But once the game's going, your footwear might change and your approach. But then. The game, your routes are the same. I don't know. I just think it's really fascinating that on any given week, you guys have to put that much alteration and change into. So it's, it's not very. I'm not. A, I'm not. You're the football expert, but sitting here thinking and listening, I think you know Kyle's onto something. So a running back, right? When he's on a when he's in a dome, he has you know he has his he has a toolbox full of things that he can do when they hand him the ball as far as how he attacks the line of scrimmage and yeah. he can use patience and all that when it's when he's in a snowstorm, yeah, that's true. He's the running, elements change. He's running yeah. straight ahead, yeah, and he's got a, you know, he's got a certain. It's one pace straight ahead. Yeah, he looks the same the entire game as far as everything he does. Right? Yeah, it's fair. Yeah, yeah, the, the elements definitely change us. A wet day, rain, snow, cold and you know, cold and hot. That the elements we operate in definitely change our environment. The actual. That would stadium. be the comparable. That would be the comparable. That's, I think that's a good point. I appreciate you guys joining. This is a huge treat for our audience. Having you guys here together in person um, is just is super special. So thank you guys so much for joining us here on You Think. All right. Thanks, Greg. Thank you.